Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Omni Athlete. You're here because like us, you believe that sport is a vehicle for elevating global consciousness. But you know that elevating consciousness through sport only matters if it actually helps you to compete at your highest level. We created this show to empower your performance with the wisdom and techniques of the world's highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors. Okay, so today's guest is a former Olympic beach volleyball player and a member of the Stanford Athletics Hall of Fame who sees life as the ultimate spiritual sport. As an up-and-coming multi-sport athlete in high school, a nasty fall on the basketball court and broken throwing arm led him to pursue volleyball, quickly rising through the ranks and becoming a top-ranked recruit. A standout at Stanford, he would accumulate a massive amount of kills and digs that would ultimately place him on the top 10 list for each in program history. This success earned him the opportunity to play for Team USA in the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, where he won a gold medal as the team's outside hitter. Despite his rapid ascension through the athletic sphere, the destructive choices he made and life's own set of challenges ultimately caught up with him after his career, forcing him to undergo a radical transformation on the road to reconstructing his very reality. He found that transformation through the integration, health, and growth of his mental, emotional, physical, energetic, and spiritual realms. An awakening and passion he shares today through his show, Sports Kitchen, the development of Platform 14, and shaping the transformational development of young volleyball players as a coach and mentor. It's my pleasure to introduce the Omni Athlete, the volley doctor and host of Sports Kitchen, John Root. Welcome to the show, John. Josh, thank you very much. Kudos to you. That was a well-done intro, my friend. <laughs> you've, John, you've got an incredible story, man. I, uh, th there's so many places we could start. What What's coming to mind for you? You know... I, I'm gratitude first. Just I was uh, literally, you know, having been in my mind and trying to live in this space. Uh, sometimes you feel a little in insular or isolated. Yeah. But Allison, uh, one of the Omni athletes, had reached out to me via Facebook on a couple of posts around an upcoming upcoming writing project, and uh, kind of reorged my Saturday to come up and, you know, kind of meet the crew. I'm just happy to be here and happy to connect with the community and share what has been, you know, a personal platform that started in sports. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in there and say that some of my earliest philosophies were shaped pretty strongly by uh, something I was a big fan of Eastern philosophy going through college. And there were some uh, writings that actually were hard to find substance on, but it was this concept around the Aristotles, Plato's, and Socrates of the world, mm -hmm. including Pythagoras, our geometry friend, who were instituting the ancient Greek schools of wisdom. And what I had found fascinating about the platform was that for what I could find in, in the description of the philosophies, it was proffered that you would only learn the metaphysical, the esoteric teachings until an in-depth study of the mind-body relationship was understood with more clarity. And especially and specifically, the mind under duress. Um, and as we all know, this is a trigger point for all these things that come into play with mental training, um, you know, positivity, and, and, you know, so many people write about it. Um, but it, it just clicked. And having understood that and gone through that as an athlete, understanding there were places I could not take myself without coach or without uh, authority or a discipline to kind of get me to a certain stretch, it set me off on this exploration of tying together some of the Eastern principles, um, things that I had worked with actively through my training, you know, breath-based work, uh, trying to use visualization with high degrees of success. So it was all a personal thing, and, and life and its transformation post-sport was, uh, you know, thank God I had the toolbox <laughs> it, because yeah. there were places that I found myself that I was not uh, comfortable with, nor it was brand new territory. Mm. So life, the spiritual sport, became an operating paradigm for me because at some point of despair, I needed to make something esoteric more tangible for myself. I needed to put something on the wall that I could leave the house every day and go, okay, what are my specific goals? What, you know, what can I do to keep myself above water? Yeah. Um, and so it led to an integration of things that I had to check in with on a, you know, a daily to a weekly basis. And those are what I'm coming to call my five circles of consciousness. And, and as you mentioned, you know, our, our operating systems as you were mental, emotional, physical, energetic, and spiritual. And so uh, it's a very, important operational base for me today. 
Where do you think that most athletes struggle the most to integrate those realms, those operating systems? And the reason I ask too is because mental, physical, emotional, those feel really strong and tangible. But a lot of times the spiritual and energetic, I think for athletes can get challenging or the energetic and emotional, right? So where, where is the challenge that you've seen and, and where was it for you personally? You know, it's a good question. I see this in coaching U18 and I'm referring to a challenge that I perceive. Um, you know, we all know, and for the people that are involved in this group and you guys that organize this, you know, something that, that I think I'm culling from the writing and the, and the teachings is something that I'm coming to terms with. And that is, you know, the material, the metaphysical side of everything that we do physical, you know, I, I very much, this is a, a two part conversation. But when you when you blend it, you know, these concepts are very, you know, sexy. I don't know if that's the right word. They're very alluring. And when you have a taste of them, uh, it opens doors and, and you begin to explore new things. You know, it's not everybody's drawn to it. However, I have found that in even in my attempts at teaching, you know, the practicum of guiding an athlete into a tangible process is time consuming. Mm. Um, one of the things I think all practitioners may or may not struggle with, I, I do, you know, I'm speaking from my own experience is how can you best distill a pretty abstract set of concepts and convince an athlete that, okay, this is a time investment, like anything else you're going to do reps, laps, you know, time work, you know, strength, performance, conditioning, nutrition, this has to be integrated, but how do they know the way, you know, mm. it's, you, you try not to get so absorbed in one-on-one -on -one teaching because you want to affect more and, and the capability of affecting more. Um, but I feel that the, the early stages of setting somebody on the right path are, are very important. Um, and you have to have the wisdom in the space because you don't want to lead somebody down the wrong path or give them, a, you know, some pearls. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're, they're going off and doing something more on the dark side <laughs> you know? sure. or, or maybe a, a quote improper way, you know? So it's tricky, you know? Um, I see things that I heard at the conference around, you know, today we challenge with athletes. I think there's an adult level for some people that have made it through, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to the collegiate crowd that now have the capability of independent thinking. Right. And if you get around good information and you're a smart person, then you're attracted to that and you know, it's going to do you some good. I feel in my coaching years and I'm talking the last six or seven years, I struggle. I'm over 50. So I struggle with an old school value system that I have with precision based training mm. and the, there's not an equal sign in the youth today. And I don't want to make this a broad statement because it's tricky, but I feel that maybe this is where I am in Northern California. The younger age groups are not exposed to enduring a challenge um, through a satisfactory growth point. If that makes sense, you know, parents are so fast to step in, you know, what's wrong What you know, let me talk to the coach. You know, they're, they become negotiators. They become uh, filters for things that are taught. And if it's disagreed and under the household, it's a tough thing to continue that teaching with the kid when you don't have them under your, your oversight. So let's, let's unpack that because that is incredibly challenging, right? Where, uh, for you as an athlete, can you reflect on how you felt or knew when you were at those points of, okay, I'm enduring, but I'm starting to hit a growth point or I'm enduring too far. Like this is, this has gone to a point where it's no longer a positive uh, growth opportunity. It's just draining and negative. Uh, there, you know, two examples, if we use the, you know, the, this duality conversation and performance and transformation, yeah. there was on the sports side of my life, it was hard to find resources back in the eighties when I was kind of honing, um, you know, and I had knew of Esalen, I knew of Michael Murphy, I, you know, known of Ken Wilbur and, you know, some of these people that were in the consciousness space, but it was hard to find a mentor, a somebody. So I guess basically it was kind of self-taught. It was exploring and reading and, and kind of trying to grasp things that seemed to help. I gravitated towards things that, uh, 
I explored on my own the concepts of, you know, passive meditation or active meditation. You know, what is, what's breath and, and breathing, you know, cadence, rhythm and flow. Uh, there were concepts around, you know, mentally and training. If I, if I seemed not to be able to execute a certain technical series, I had to drop into kind of, you know, that higher power conversation of, okay, if I set the vision up right, I have to trust that the dots are going to get connected by my higher self because that ultra consciousness is, is going to take care of the last yard, but there was nobody around to teach it, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and now there are, and you have athletes that believe and, and know that it has an impact. So I think as we go forward and I'm going to just say this as a community, you know, that I think we're all going to be, uh, challenged to find ways to make this tangible, you know, make this more accessible. You know, how can you utilize 30 to 45 minutes um, and bypass a day of maybe being in the weight room and understand and appreciate that this is going to have value. Um, the transformational side was school of hard knocks, you know, going out, really relying on people that even weird, you know, I had done so much in the athletic space. You, you get to a place of personal transformation and, I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't know what to do. So I had to dip back into my toolbox, understand how to learn tools that I had and apply them in a different way. What do you mean by you didn't know what to do? You know, it was a despair point. It was kind of zeros across the board. You know, I uh, was diagnosed with cancer, uh, lost a parent, you know, had some situations that kind of set me straight in the head about, wow, you know, what, what's going on? I had dealt with a mental, physical kind of set of challenges. And then all of a sudden there was this part two emotional, spiritual. Um, and even for me, I kind of found my place in a dead zone. Uh, spiritual conversations and dialogue seemingly shut down. It was a lot of why taking myself into dark places, you know, self-medicating, all those things. And at some point, it, you know, you basically – have to kind of get a head check and go, this is broken. You know, I'm not admitting that I'm broken, but my process is broken. So that was the genesis of platform 14. It was a basic reminder to myself that there's one point from four others. And those four others were the mental, emotional, physical, and energetic. And if it ended up being a spiritual point, that's great. If it started as a spiritual point and had to get filtered in, into those different realms, that too. So I had to come about it as a way of critical analysis of literally being reactive. You know, if you wrote reactive on a board and you excise that C in the middle and you move it to the left, now you've got creative. Mm. So it was just a shift in perspective. What, what I found so fascinating, John, is this notion that, you know, as, as an elite athlete, you cultivated such a profound and strong set of specific skills and connections to your body, right? And and I think as athletes, we all go through this, but when we leave sport, it becomes really challenging to bring that into life afterward, right? It becomes this kind of, and you alluded to this, so, so what can we do to better map the skills, the knowledge, the awareness that we develop when we are competing and pushing ourselves in that, that realm to life beyond sport, even if we're still competing? You know, it's... It's tricky. I feel my, my perspective is a little biased, but I think if anybody has been through a high level uh, collegiate experience or has been blessed enough to be able to move on uh, professional or semi-professional, whatever you want to term it, there's no direct relationship to your structure and experience and performance in sports with how the rest of the world is going to treat you. Mm. <laughs> um, Part of it is you get used to a very light kind environment where if cream rises, then the perspective and attitudes that are around you, you assume or presume have been shaped accordingly. And so you just by definition get to cut out a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Life's, life doesn't prove that to you. You know, <laughs> we are in a situation where, you know, my own experience, I, I had to admit that I was extremely naive, you know, a handshake, a, a word, a, you know, a deal and say, let's do this because it's my word yeah. and it doesn't get honored. And I know it sounds like a minor example, but this blends into, you know, dreams and pursuits, you know, getting squashed or, you know, glass ceilings in the corporate environment or personal challenges, you know, for however we grew up under parents, uh, you know, that weren't a very emotive set uh, generationally. 
So you find that the old model doesn't immediately translate. Mm. Now, what we hope to have learned from sport is that the paradigms of discipline, all the basics, all the cliches, the repetition, the vision, the be able to create, you know, all of this starting from a place of heart spark, you know, and, and looking into, okay, well, what is for my best and highest good, but expanding that conversation and saying, what is, this, what is for my best and highest good and everybody that's going to be involved in this? Mm. And it was allowing me to kind of elevate into a spiritual conversation. Quit looking in the rearview mirror, quit whining, quit, you know, you, you've got the tools. Yes, there were days I take my gold medal, I go in the middle, you know, go cry, get it out and go, okay, well, get your shit together. Yeah. And we know we have a plan because you've done this before. It's just a different application. You know, it's a different intention. What energy am I putting into this situation? to attention. What am I focusing at or on? And I had to be very careful about the energy that I was generating internally and manifesting because, you know, if I say that I'm not drama, but my life is drama, you know, who, you know, shit jokes on me. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, one of the points that you made is this notion of kind of finding your heart or finding that that place of energy drawing from that energetic space and i would love for you to share what it felt like what the difference was right what did it feel like to be living and performing and just experiencing life cut off from that energetic space and then what happened that made you say oh this is what it's supposed to feel like this is the connection that i've been waiting on or, or, or needing to draw through my next level yeah that's a that's a good question and uh i'm i'm hesitating because it, a crystallized answer is is tough yeah um for you know wow how do i how do i lead into this um can you put a put a piece of that question forward to me again? So the I guess the first piece is what did it feel like to be disconnected from your heart as you went through life and performance, right? Like what what was that energetic feeling? What was that experience like? Because it feels like such a stark contrast to when you were able to connect to it and draw from it. Yes. So in the, you know, there's an ego-based creation and there's something that I call is driven from a heart spark. Hmm. For so long as an athlete, you are, you know, you're stuck in this, you know, if you look at the, the three bodies, the, the gross, the subtle, and the causal, you, you're, you're stuck in this immediate gratification, kind of immediate response hmm. mechanism, if you will. Uh, training, you know, results, whether it's time-based, whether it's team-based, subjective, objective. In some ways, it's the the expansion part, the the heart part, the you know the spirituality part of looking at sport as artistic, or mm -hmm. if you say you know competition is just God's time to play. There's a there's a correlation in there that builds off of that mental construct. Mm -hmm. I found that when I was in a very strong place of mindset that it actually was not to my advantage. Uh, there were things that I was constructing that, you know, you're banging your head against a wall because this is the way that it has to be. Mm. Um, if I was able to dip back into kind of a practice that I have called head, head trip versus intuition yeah. and understanding, you know, the head chatter and the mind chatter, for me, the only intuitive truth came through heart space where I would have to ask the question, what am I missing here? You know, there, there's something else involved and, and I don't seem to be grasping this. And so spirit, can you step in and, and just lift the veil for me here? And that is a place that you find the connection in that heart spark. It's, it's all creation is it's a love based venture, you know? Um, so I think I'd ask, answer your question is once I kind of looked back and go, wow, that was pretty dead living, <laughs> you know, or it's not unconscious because you didn't know any better, right. but once you are exposed to it, it's like a door into this beautiful living room and you're like, wow, I want to hang out this place for a little while and explore the view, you know? Yeah. Th there is a, 
the reason I asked that question too, John, is that there's such a courage required to step into that space, right? And to really pull that thread once we feel it. And whether we're in the midst of competition or whether we're, we're, we're done playing and, and competing at that level, it just, it takes so much courage to really sit and be honest with ourselves, right? And really ask the tough questions internally and those mindful questions. And so I don't know if this is a question as much as it is just what comes to mind for me is that that challenge of both the courage to do it yourself and then to try to find a way to fit that into a culture within sport, maybe at large, that's still coming to terms with that reality or coming to terms with that perspective. You know, yeah, there's, you see it across all athletes. I don't know if I'm going to answer this question right or well, but there's difficulties across the board. Um, Guys out of control, you know, uh, losing emotional balance, mismanaging, you know, partying, just living it up. I mean, there, there's all kinds of examples of dysfunction. You saw the Seahawks go through a phase, you know, football wise with a couple of years when it was talked about even Richard Sherman, who I knew from Stanford, you know, he's a talker and a chatter, but deep down he absorbs some of these, you know, proverbs, so to speak. Um, you know, they're, there was a certain place of realization. There was it, what brought back was, you know, this conversation of, of heart spark or love or spirituality being connected, being disconnected. I come back to this concept of the zone, you mm-hmm. know, or being in the flow. And I know there's a couple of people in the group that write about this, but the one thing that really was profound was the first time I had to acknowledge that I was compete. I, I was just out of my head. I mean, you talk about this for me personally, there's a little difference esoterically between being in a flow or being in the flow and trying to describe what the zone mm. actually is. For me, it's that is and was the peak experience in a spiritual capacity for, wow, this is so far beyond anything that I consciously trained for, I could prepare myself for it, couldn't plan on it, couldn't Mm -hmm. invoke it, but it happened. You know, when the billions of variables click and your combination comes around, there is nothing that's going to get in your way. And to me, that was the ultimate conversation of there's a lot more going on here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I'm kind of surprised that more professional athletes or even D1 athletes at a high level, D2, D3, um, don't talk about this more. Mm. You know, what what the shifts are from the the team, the brutality, you know, the force. I mean, we every, every competition, you know, arcs and angles, geometry, time, you know, but there is a transcendental component to performance, mm. which – kind of mind boggles me that it hasn't been more leveraged. <laughs> yeah. Do you, and do you mean leverage from a standpoint of just purely performance? Training, applications, models, methods, um, getting a group of, of people who are impact players already combined with a group of rookies, you know, people that are new to the space and just using it as a, a social psychological experiment of, you know, everybody talks about, okay, this mental thing, you know, but, there's our, there's an operating system in the mind, you know, as much as it's yes, no, love, hate, fear, love, it's laws of positivity. How do you quelch mental chatter from a negative distraction side to keeping things framed up positive? Same in the emotional field. You know, we know what's required in our physical body. You know, we have to look at and respect energy as a system, an operating system in and of itself. You know, our chakras, all these things tie together. They're not individual components to be left out there to absorb one. That's great. But there's a lot of other people that are involved and they and they want to be involved. It's the integration, which is the holy grail. Yeah. So there's two questions that come to mind. And the the first one is kind of a left turn, but it feels related. And it's this notion of creativity within sport. And what was the first, if you can recall, or just the even the feeling, if it wasn't a specific moment, where you started to see those two worlds mesh? <laughs> I was a young punk, dude. And this is a funny story because it was one of my early, my first grasp mentally as a kid. I was like, I think I was eight or nine, and I was going up to the local park, and I had been doing t-ball and, you know, doing these things. But the big boys were always with their shirts off in the park playing hoops. 
Right. You know, and here I am, this little grunt and squirt, and I just wanted to get involved. Long story short, after, you know, exclusion, 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 did, you know, you're, you're nine. Why do you, you know, I'm like, look, I, I can do some things, just I need to learn a little bit. Right. It was understanding how to be of value in a system mm-hmm. where I knew almost nothing about, but figured out if I did a couple small things well, Boy, did the attaboys come and the nice steel kid and you keep being a mosquito and running around under guys' legs and you just toss the ball out here. And I was like, wow, these guys actually like me because I'm contributing something that's benefiting them. And wow, what a concept. (laughs) (laughs) So the the concept of sacrifice and service in a team environment kind of got hammered into me pretty quick because I couldn't prove myself. Hmm. Um, And that attitude of finding a way to add value, whether I was a role player or whether even if I was the significant guy that day on the court with the saddle on his back going, it's your turn to carry the team. (laughs) Okay, well, that attitude became, you're not going to stop me. You might be able to slow me down. So I'm going to have to get creative about how I'm going to get this done. Mm. You know, and you're always, at least for me, was always trying to figure out that ultimate problem solve. You know, if somebody's going to stop me, how are they going to do it? And if I'm going to succeed and be able to be invited back to this court and be, you know, going playing with the, the big dudes that are all sweaty and gross, you know, why and what's my value to them? So those were some of my early shapings. <laughs> yeah. I, so. It- it's really interesting because I, I think that is that notion of value creation, right? We take for granted within the context of sport, right? It's a, it's a really natural model to map to say life and business, right? We, we think very often about creating value, but in a sport, especially in team sport, it is truly about what value do you bring and how can you create that value, but it's not a fixed value either. It can be, you can mold it and shape it. That's really energizing because we don't maybe articulate that in the same way always. I try to convey this. I work with boys and girls, you know, and if I if I try to get into this concept around creation and love base and heart spark, yeah. I, I find myself uh, trying to frame this up in the terms of service and sacrifice mm. in a team environment. What is your sacrifice going to be? And it means different things for different people. And as a service role, let's frame this up as a way of how are you helping the team mm. and what are what is your value add going to be? Because as a coach, I need to find a reason to keep you in my 12. Right. So right now, if you can convince me of a couple of things, you know, <laughs> then I can commit to you that you have a future over the next six or seven months, you know. So it's trying to convince these kids that, you know, uh, something's good. Something good is there. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And what do you do in the process of developing that relationship to start building the, the levels of trust and honesty between you and both the team and your individual players that you think really helps build the energy of the group? Those are tricky. I find myself every year shotgunning a bunch of principles and hope that stuff sticks. Um, You know, I, I, I was primarily in a 17s age group last year. I switched down to a younger group at 13s because in some part it was an experiment for me to see where are the minds going to start absorbing this stuff. You know, if sport is becoming such a channel and an opportunity and parents are investing so much money in club sport as, you know, quote, a hedge on an athletic scholarship, then are these kids kind of understanding what the path is going to be, you know, how competitive it is there nationally. So it was a, it was a mixed experiment. Um, I think you ha- and this is the hard thing. Rarely do you get a hundred percent buy-in, you know, I got 12 kids, let's say on a roster and I'll have nine kids and then I'll have three distortion pieces. Um, something in it for them is not working, you know, it's either not enough playing time or I, you know, I'm not getting an opportunity. So you got to just, at least for me, I try to base it on relevant stories. Um, I do exercises with my kids. We do visualization, we do imagery work, we get them connected with, you know, things that are related, but not related power totems, you know, or power warrior symbols you know, something that they can chatter about and and have some fun. 
But at the end of the day, it's a conversation of trust. You know, it's like kids been there. You got to trust me. And that's tough to do. You know, it's tough to do, especially when you have kids for a short amount of time. This is not a quick uptake conversation. You know, this is this is shaping. Like you say, you know, an aspiring shaper. It's not short term work. <laughs> no, it's it's long term and it requires a, a different set of skills at each developmental moment, right? At each place that those, those individuals are at too, as we're, as we're building and shaping. Um, so this is, this is another left turn, John, but I'm really curious, tell and share a little bit about what inspired you to start the sports kitchen and where food and consciousness and sport intersect. So all of the work that I'm doing right now is, is kind of consciousness based. Um, my personal belief is it's about consciousness and it's about time. <laughs> it's been something that I'm, I'll say that I'm shocked again, uh, that this has not been more pervasive, not only in society and culture. Um, we're operating on some fairly ignorant themes right there mm. you know, for what's happening, uh, in our world. Um, and I feel we're getting a little lost. Yeah. Um, so the sports kitchen came about as a desire to blend food, fitness, health, and wellness, mm. you know, with the, with the, the kind of the idea of I traveled the world kind of preparing 14 years for the national team. I had a passion about how other cultures express their divinity. Mm. And in that, you know, kind of weird back of the house shamans or witches or, you know, healers, there was the cultural aspect of food and sport and the community and the celebration and, um, you know, pre-sport and post-competition and the highs and the lows and the family and the farming and the food to table. So somewhere in there, I love to cook. I'm a sports lover. I'm a kitchen enthusiast. I've learned all the hot buttons, you know, the nutrition, the health, wellness, the, you know, been there, done that. So I feel you don't need a trained chef to kind of tell you how to eat well. It's fun. It can be fun good food made easy. So my platform on the kitchen side is we're going to talk about food, fitness, health and wellness, performance and positivity. You know, uh, let's get this consciousness conversation going. And that's the TV show platform. And then the writing is a little more esoteric, a little more intense around this performance and transformation concept. And it requires approaching from a multifaceted view sometimes, right? Being able to say, where are, where is somebody going to on-ramp, right? Where are they going to connect with you at first and what stage are they going to be at to understand what you're trying to bring? That's the thing. I, I'm coming from a pretty high level view. And so even on the TV side, it's hard to crystallize, you know, basic concepts into, I think the core intention with the show is education on nutrition. And some of it's obvious, but some of it is just basic learning, you know, whether you're, a mom trying to, you know, keep hungry teenagers just fed or you're, you know, trying to get kids to eat more fresh or understand what nutrition is going to be supportive over three or four day competitions. Um, so some of it is trying to just make it a little more accessible, a little more fun, but from a guy who has some hardware and, and live the life, you know, and want to bring up kind of the fun food facts around everything, fitness and food. I love that, John. It's uh, it's really energizing because I think we, and and it's a space that's evolving more and more, right? But but food and not just the the literal food itself, but the the way that we relate to food and the energy it gives us, what we put in our body, seems like a space that we're starting to spend a lot more attention and and really direct a lot more attention to, so that it's not just say the macros, but it has to do with everything else around the food as well. You're, you're spot on, Josh. It's, you know, the, ironically, the conversation is very in vogue right now. The, you know, these, the brain gut conversation, or it started with the probiotic thing a couple of years ago, and now it's the fermentation thing. And, um, you know, you'll see, you see Oprah kind of investing into the food movement with true food kitchens, which is, you know, this healthy kind of, you know, getting away off of animal proteins. And, you know, there's conversations around sustainability, but I do feel, you know, in my own health issues, uh, you know, it's food is as fuel. It's also medicine. Um, and of course it's nutrition and given the proper respect, you know, I had cancer early and I modified a regimen around it. You know, I, I come from a family of people who have a history of Alzheimer's and dementia. And so, you know, I'm very kind of freaky with things that I put into my body around sustenance, but 
there is a lot to offer around plant-based. It's not necessarily my way. I'm not a vegan. You know, I like my cow. I like, I like my other proteins, but from a place of education, making it a little more tangible and really blending in the importance of nutritional education to young adults, I feel is a, a, something I'm passionate about. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, John, this is, this has been really energizing and integrating where, uh, before, before I ask my, my final question here, where can these guys go to connect with you online? Thanks. My website is johnroot.net, J-O-N-R-O-O-T.net. Uh, there's some sports kitchen stuff there. I'm building out the website with a new writing project. Uh, my first book, which is no longer in circulation, like the spiritual sport, um, is listed on there. Uh, but I'm moving on to other projects. And so we're trying to kind of craft this. Um, hopefully we'll, you know, be with you guys doing stuff, you know, um, trying to get the message out and the word out as a, as a building practitioner and, you know, a philosophical mind on all this stuff. Um, and hopefully you'll see the show in 2018 on cable. <laughs> love it. I love it. It's good. Uh, so the, the final question, John, this show is called I'm the Athlete because we want to understand what it takes to be the ultimate mind, body, and spirit competitor. So our final question is, what does it mean to you to be an Omni Athlete? Um, Omni Athlete, I would classify, you know, if I was to put that hat on and say I'm an Omni Athlete, I have to kind of build into my core principles. Um, integrity is one of them. Hmm. Um Transparency is another. Um, Heart-based and hearts-based action only would be a third. Um, And last, it would be the, you know, I've accumulated, I feel, quite a unique set of experiences in my life. You know, pros, challenges, and positives. um, And I don't want to let that toolbox sit on the shelf and collect dust. (laughs) Mm. I, I need to put it out there somehow. So I think dumping it out, paying it forward, passing it on. <laughs> if I'm an Omni athlete, I feel I want to teach to those that are hungry and I will feed you well. <laughs> I love that. I love, thank you, John. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah, this has been, like I said, incredible. John, thank you Great. for being on the show. Guys, go dive deep into John's world <laughs> and, and be number one, prepared and number two, energized to recognize there is a level of integration that we can find with these different at times pieces of human experience of the athletic experience that we take for granted as separate pieces, right? And they're not separate. And one of the things that you'll learn immediately when you connect with John and when you start reading the work he's put together, when you watch his content, it's all one and the same, right? It's all different pieces of the same puzzle that we're working through. And one of the greatest challenges and also greatest opportunities we have as athletes is to begin seeing everything as part of this continual experience that we are creating. And John is literally championing that kind of model right now. And he's put it out there for the world to see and you have access to it whenever you want. So go dive deep into his world, watch the content he's putting together right now and, and just stay connected because this is where the shift is occurring. And until next time, guys, thank you for watching this episode of On The Athlete. Hey, hey, what is up, guys? Thank you for watching another episode of Omni Athlete. Please, please, please go like and subscribe to our podcast. That is our goal right now is just to build this community as big as we possibly can. And we need your help to do it. So like and subscribe, share our content, guys. If if this content adds any value to your world that helps you perform, connect, go deeper, go wider, Whatever it is that it does for you, if it provides value, all we ask is that you share our content and help grow this community. We can't accomplish our goal of elevating global consciousness through sport without you. You are an integral part of this mission and this purpose, and we need your help. So please go like, subscribe, and share our content and continue to help us build and grow this community that is truly motivated to not just elevate consciousness, but elevate and shift the very culture of sport so that we can truly experience the athletic experience in a brand new and energizing way for so, so many people, guys. So thank you. And please like and subscribe. Until next time.